Well, thank you all for coming. I'm delighted that you're spending your Tuesday afternoon with us. I guess it's evening now. Um, help yourself to a beverage in the back. But this is our last week of the color theory exhibit, Explorations of Pigment. And so that is very apropos for what uh, Dr. Preston McLean is gonna be talking with us tonight, about tonight. Um, the whole concept behind this exhibit is really how color impacts us as a viewing experience. And so you'll flow from the reds to the oranges, to the yellows, to the greens, to the blues. And rather than focus on theme, really let the color speak for itself. So I hope you all have had a chance to walk around and look at the exhibit. If not, definitely take a look afterwards. But um, Preston's been kind enough to put together a nice talk with us about how color has impacted art throughout history. So I'm very excited about this. And uh, I'll What's it it I'm very excited to be invited back. We did one of these for uh, the Derby celebration mm -hmm. earlier this year. And I had such fun doing it. And it's very generous of Lemoyne to see, uh, the, see MOFA, the Museum of Fine Arts at Florida State University, and uh, Lemoyne as worthy partners in community outreach and programming like this. Um, I invite you, if you are not already familiar with the Museum of Fine Arts, we've had to uh, be on a bit of a hiatus for a while. We reopened uh, all of our galleries yesterday, uh, and we welcome folks to come in. Uh, if you don't mind me doing a little oh, bit of a set it. promotion. <laughs> and I'm gonna, if, if, if everyone's okay since I'm lecturing, I am gonna take my mask down while I'm up here. Um, I think it'll make it easier for everyone to hear me. Uh, and I don't know if this is something you want me to turn on. I think it would help for us since we're recording this because other people oh. wanted to come okay. and weren't able to. Great. Um, so we're going to share this with the public afterwards. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, they're, they're, it's always a bit extemporaneous, uh, but we'll, uh, I hope everybody has a good time. And I want to make sure that you know that the museum is open from 10 to 5, Monday through Friday. We have uh, evening hours on Thursday until 8 o'clock and Saturdays from 10 to 4. We have wonderful exhibitions. I won't take up too much time talking about them, but check us out at, uh, at our website, mofa.fsu.edu, or follow us on Instagram, fsumofa, to see what's going on. We're always posting and sharing information about the projects that we have um, at, at FSU. So what I've done is prepared a PowerPoint presentation to give uh, the group here a little bit of insight both into color as a theory, as the theories of color, but also the history of color, pigments, and the way that uh, specific artworks reflect time, uh, geography, and cultural context through the very deliberate use of color that artists uh, make when they select a color and a concept to present through artwork. But the first thing I was going to do is uh, see if there's any, if there are any art historians or critics in the room who can recognize one or another of the works of art that are on this screen. We've had a good while to look at these. Or the artists, let's say, whose work is represented by either of these works. They're two different artists, very different artists from different times. But as you can see, they both got uh, from the formal presentation of color as a central aspect of their creative practice. Alberts? Alberts, yes. Joseph Alberts uh, is the artist whose work is on the left. Uh, that's a painting by Joseph Alberts. He's uh, most famous uh, for his uh, relationship with the Bauhaus early in his career. He came to the United States, left uh, Nazi Germany, settled for uh, some length of time at Black Mountain College in North Carolina, where he worked with uh, some of the most innovative uh, creators in the 20th century. Modernism, really the crucible of modernism in the United States. John Cage, the composer. Asawa, uh, the sculptor. Uh, so yes, that is uh, Joseph Albers. And the other artist, who's more, a little more contemporary, this is, a, this is a sky space, if that's a clue, by the artist James Turrell. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about each of these uh, artists' work. So the painting on the left and the uh, architectural installation, that is actually a window that looks out into the sky. Uh, and the artist uses color and light uh, to create uh, sensory impressions that are, are, are um, built around the human ability to perceive uh, different colors differently depending on how they're juxtaposed within a, a well-controlled uh, space of light. So let's uh, just quickly go through some of the color theory concepts that Albers and 
uh, Terrell are pursuing in their work before we move on to the pigment phase of the presentation. So uh, in 1949, Joseph Albers began a series, you probably recognize these works, they were widely distributed, and many people think of Albers as one of the premier 20th century pedagogues, teachers about art. He was an art educator, he explored color, he wrote a number of treatises that have been influential since they were first published, and you really can't appreciate the way that color work uh, alongside one another without encountering at some point Joseph Albers' creativity and Joseph Albers' science in, re in a real sense. And you can see here that the, the, the subject matter of his work is the color itself and the relationship between the colors as he presents these stacked squares. And there were series of these that were produced as uh, collages of paper, as oil paintings, uh, and then as prints uh, as well. So here's a quote, color is almost never seen as it really is. And I think if you look around the room here, you can appreciate that right away, is that the color becomes much more lively depending on what it's next to, uh, and the uh, amount of light that's directed at the work also changes how impressive and powerful and affecting color is. This was at the center of Joseph Albers's uh, practice. And so here's a series of Albers's work, uh, the relativity of color, something that's often associated with Albers, and homage to the square became a body of more than a thousand paintings and drawings, prints and tapestries, which were created over 25 years. These are just a few of them, and they've been uh, reproduced in various collectible series, and I encourage you to get to know a little bit more about Joseph Albers if, it, if the specific interrelationship between hues is of interest to you. Uh, we've all seen these sort of uh, these optical illusions and tricks that uh, we play. Maybe you, some of you remember a few years ago, I didn't clutter the presentation with this, but do you remember that dress? Maybe 2014 or 2015. Does anyone remember that? And how controversial it was. What is it, was it gold and white or was it black and blue? Do we remember this? Yeah, that dress, it was like, it was, it was trending all over the place. There were, it was hashtag that dress or hashtag gold and white or hashtag black and blue. People got really hot about it too. They couldn't believe that someone was seeing a set of colors that was not so obviously what the dress was. Um, but this uh, is a, a, a much longer uh, history of exploration of how the juxtaposition of colors can change your sense of what you're seeing. And so I think it goes without saying, looking at this example, that with the, the television maybe not being ideal, glare or whatnot, we appreciate that that square, that, that, that square on the left, looks quite a bit more brown than the square on the right, which looks quite a bit more orange. And yet we know uh, intellectually that they are in fact the same color. This is actually a photograph of a set of uh, pieces of construction paper, colored construction paper that have been laid one on top of the other. So there's a single strip of paper that is stretching between the yellow and the blue, the ends of which you're seeing there uh, in this collage. Right? So these are not novel concepts, but this is an extension of the type of work that Joseph Albers was doing. So Albers did this with pigments. Albers did this with paper, and he recommended, if you want to play with this yourselves, he really recommended working with construction paper because it's a lot harder to get your pigments to behave. Uh, and, and artists among us who might work with oil or work with watercolor or work with acrylic appreciate what he means, that the amount of paint, uh, paint, uh, paint you're using and the substrate of whatever you're painting on has a tendency to come through and affect the power of those pigments. So get yourself some good old-fashioned construction paper and play around with it. Um, it's time well spent. And of course, computers now obviate the need to, to play with material at all, but I still like to do things with my hands. Now, the second artist who I introduced at the beginning is James Terrell. And this is, there are two aspects of James Terrell's practice that I just want to introduce. There's gonna be a lot of introducing tonight and not a lot of exposition about what I'm introducing because there's so much to cover in just about 50 minutes of talking. Uh, so James Terrell is a light sculptor. Light, he says, is not so much something that reveals as it is itself a revelation. And James Terrell, American uh, sculptor, American architect and designer of light, uh, he came up in the Quaker uh, tradition. And if you know much about Quakerism, you know that there's a lot of uh, contemplation. There's a lot of waiting for the light is in fact one of the, the, the concepts that you'll, you'll hear sort of imbued when the friends gather. Uh, and wait to sort of determine what they're going to share, what they're going to talk about, and what they're going to emphasize in their pursuit of, uh, of a better relationship with the divine. And so having grown up within this space, he became somewhat enamored of light as a potential medium to sculpt with. 
He also, as you can see from just this photograph of an installation, was a, a, an admirer of Joseph Alberts' work as well. And this much more recent piece, just from a couple of years ago, uh, City of Light, this is a photograph of uh, one of his interior compositions, where he's using colored light in a very particular and controlled way in a space where he has total control over the, the, the environment. A, a, a room that would otherwise be black, but for the introduction of color and light and playing with this. So similarly to what Albers did, you can see that Terrell, this is, the, this is the same space as it goes through various iterations um, through this carefully controlled sculptural uh, light process. I like to use light as a material, Terrell says, but my medium is actually perception. I want you to sense yourself sensing, to see yourself seeing. And so one thing which I think is apparent up until this point, but I'll uh, emphasize the point, is that neither Albers nor, nor Terrell are giving us any subject matter to look at yet, right? We're really looking at pure color and the relationship of color or light and color uh, as, a, as an unkind of uh, adulterated experience of form and, uh, and the impression of light and the impression of color is what we take away from it. And it's, it's raw beauty uh, without having to go through some process of, uh, of association with subject matter that brings in narrative context or cultural associations or things like that. Now these are the interior pieces by Terrell. Let me show you a couple of, a suite of photographs of one of these sky spaces. That's from the, the first uh, slide that I showed you. He's, he says, I sell blue sky and color to air. Uh, so here you can see a photograph that was taken from inside a sky space and the, close, the, the nearest sky space that I can recommend to you all if you're interested in seeking out the experience of the James Terrell piece is at the Ringling uh, campus in Sarasota. They have a sky space called Joseph's uh, Coat. Uh, if, if for those of you who know your have scripture knowledge, you might uh, recognize that association. It's wildly colorful. Uh, it's a, a, an atrium, sort of an uh, inside-outside space where you can sit and for about an hour-long program during sundown, you watch the sky change colors in ways that are just as dramatic based on the colored light that is projected on the interior of the space. And so you really go within just a few seconds uh, from this deep blue to this almost kind of uh, 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 lavendery, purpley color, and this gray, and all of this is uh, affected by the way that the color that he projects uh, situates and contextualizes the sky, which obviously gets no power to control. And then one of the amazing things that I remember from having gone a couple of times is the show's over, they thank you for coming, and you get up and you think it must be absolute pitch dark outside, because at the end of the show, it just, it just, uh, reduces to just intense black. And so you think, wow, you know, it got dark early. You walk outside, it's like walking out into the street. Uh, he, he manages to make the sky go black just through the introduction of a carefully curated uh, set of lights. So these are a couple of artists whose pure exploration of color as pigment, as light, uh, are worth knowing. But now, what I'd like to do is uh, proceed to the discussion of a selected set of colors to give you some history of those colors, to understand where they come from, how they're made, and how artists have used them um, at various points in history. Uh, so we've got the word color. Yeah, it's, uh, my uh, unapologetic art historian and lawyer always uh, requires that I define my terms uh, before talking about anything. And so we need to make sure we all agree that color can be a noun, right? The property possessed by an object of producing different sensations on the eye as a result of the way the object reflects or emits light. It's a countable noun, five colors. How many colors are in this exhibition? Goodness, right? We don't even know. Maybe they're uncountable because you have all these gradations. And then there's color as an abstraction, lots of color, right? Uh, much color. And then the verb to change the color of something by painting, dyeing, or shading it to color. Right? And how, when's the last time you colored? Not recent enough, right? Yeah, we should all spend more time coloring. It used to be a verb that we did a lot more of. Um, and even, uh, even now, in the line of work that I'm in, I seldom find an, an, as much time for coloring as I wish I did. Uh, so I've selected five colors uh, to talk about. One of them isn't really a color, but I threw it on the end because there's so much fascinating stuff going on with it, black. Um, but we've got red, we've got orange, uh, green, we're going to have an interlude. I pre prepared a little, uh, little uh, 
uh, audio uh, uh, break for us uh, halfway through the presentation of the colors, and then blue and black. And hopefully we'll have some time at the end for you to share your favorite color. So let's start with red. Any questions so far before I proceed? Love to introduce a little bit of uh, dialogue if there's anything that anyone wants to observe while we're chatting. So red is certainly among the very oldest colors that uh, humankind had to work with. And now I'm going to ask a question, just so I can get a little bit of uh, another voice in the room besides my own. Uh, how do you suppose red came about so early? Why was red available to uh, to artists back 17,000 years ago? Uh, blood. They were, what? Yeah, blood. Blood. blood was certainly a source of red, red pigment, potentially. Clay. And clays, right? Uh, we have clays, dirt, stones, a lot of red, and those are very, very common. And it, it basically comes down to the oxidation of, of iron compounds. We know this from the geography of the regions in which we live. Uh, we have our red hills. Uh, and so the clays and the stones were readily available, uh, pun not intended, uh, and could be used to create vivid and stable pigments. And the term which is used for this generally is red ochre. So you might have heard this term ochre. And ochres are generally thought of as more like rusty brown colors, right? But the earliest colored pigments, these red ochres, uh, are prepared by the crushing and grinding of these uh, iron-rich uh, oxidized stones. And then the mixing of that with some kind of a binder, some kind of an agent that suspends that pigment in a, a, a material that then can be fixed when it dries on the surface. And so basically we're looking at sort of fresco techniques or the application of wet uh, oil and, uh, and pigments or fat and pigments or even just water suspended with pigments onto uh, porous surfaces. So with these Paleolithic cave paintings, uh, you, you see this highly naturalistic representation of one, the evidence of the creators themselves, whose hands are, are pressed against the wall in a way to kind of signify that they are, they are here, they, are, they have marked these spaces the sacredness and the ceremonial aspect to these, uh, to these paintings, and the reproduction of the natural world in a way that's so uh, true to life that uh, zoologists can look at paintings that are 20,000 years old and identify with great detail and specificity the species that they were representing because they're, they're drawing them in ways that are so lifelike that they're almost taxonomic in their detail. Uh, and so we, we recognize early on the interest that people have with, with red because of its associations with life, because of its associations with the color of the natural world and the animals in the world that they're representing, and because of its ready availability uh, and in quantity uh, that made it among the earliest pigments that were used. You can also see that there's black being used a lot, but we'll talk about black at the end of the presentation. And so where do we go from red ochre? Florists, they, they want something more vivid. They want something brighter, and they want to be able to, uh, to move out of those earth tones into something kind of more, much more vivid. So you see uh, the exploration of the world now um, and the trading of material that has more uh, intense colors coming from uh, more re uh, remote geographies that are part of the trade in substances that can be ground into pigments. And here we see uh, a Roman house, These are the, this is the mineral cinnabar, uh, or a merc uh, mercuric sulfides. We have mercury and sulfur that have combined in heat and pressure to create this, these crystallized red uh, uh, minerals that can be ground down into a much more vivid and stable powder that creates bright red cinnabar color. Uh, now, what do you know if you hear the words mercuric sulfide, what do you think of immediately? Poison, right? These are very poisonous materials. And the history of color, particularly pigmentation, is very often the history of people experimenting with some pretty nasty stuff that winds up hurting you if you use too much of it over too long or you're uh, in a chemistry laboratory without modern uh, health and safety precautions at your disposal. So you'll hear me mention several times about how wonderful it was for the world of art, but how unfortunate it was for the people whose job it was to collect, process, and uh, use these materials, like the, the bless their hearts, uh, the, the, the fresco artists of this uh, house in Pompeii, although things got even worse for the fresco artists uh, not too long after uh, they completed this, uh, this composition. So we have this mineral cinnabar, and it is used uh, throughout the world 
uh, because there are deposits of this that are found in, uh, in Africa, in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East, and in, in Central Asia. And so the trade of this was wide. And you'll also see examples of cinnabar-based art in, the, uh, in East Asian art practice, like these Chinese lacquers. And the cinnabar lacquer uh, is, a, is predominantly red. There are many different, I guess, trade names you can think of that are associated with these colors, but it is often referred to as a cinnabar lacquer. Powdered milk mercury sulfide is the primary colorant. And so you can see, once again, that the artists are representing the natural world here using this bright, vivid red color, which is, at its essence, is, is sort of evidence of life, of that, the, the blood and the vitality of, of nature shown in a bright red cinnabar. So on, onward, we uh, encounter a, a different source of pigment. And this, uh, coincidentally, not. Uh, we're looking at a portrait of Agostino Pallavicini, who was the doge of Genoa. And he had this very parade portrait uh, made uh, by Anthony Van Dyck. Anthony Van Dyck, an English painter, a Dutch English painter, went on a years long trip to Italy to paint all the richest and most famous people he could find. And at the time, it was a two-year doge ship. It was a very quick turnaround. Everybody wanted to have a turn being the doge uh, because the money was really good. It was mostly oligarchs uh, in, in uh, Genoa would take turns being doge. So they could go down and hang out with the pope and, and put the finery on. And um, that really was more or less how it worked in Genoa and in Venice. Um, so you can see that this gorgeous, velvety red uh, drapery that he's covered in. There must have been a reason why this was his, the clothes, these were the clothes that he intended to wear when he was meeting the Pope. I'm not joking. Uh, and and the, 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 the garment itself must have been just spectacular. But how in the world did Anthony Van Dyck create a painting that had this much red, this vivid, uh, just, just a stunning uh, example of the use of the color red? Painting really is nothing without that selection of color. Uh, 1621, what's changed in the world? Um, in, in the 17th century. Where, where, where are we that we weren't maybe 150 years earlier or so? In the East? The East had been open for a while. Those trade routes were, were quite well established. Uh, we had a, a new place to discover and to bring material back from. New world. The New World, right? So we have, we have Spanish, we have Italian, we have Northern European peoples who are going to North and South America and discovering the potential that the natural wealth and treasures of these places, uh, not always the nicest uh, forms of, of international commerce, but nonetheless bringing back things that people wanted in greater great quantities, precious metals, uh, gemstones, and things like that. There was a very curious uh, insect, which was known in the world uh, prior to this time, but had never been found in quite the abundance that they found in, in North America. Uh, these are the cochineals, right? Which are, the, which are a very specific type of beetle, bug, that live in many places, but they live in and around these cactuses that you can collect them from the cactus. This is a later print showing the process of collecting these cochineals, which allow you to make this uh, uh, very, very intense red dye. And so you have a direct extension of the trade with the new world and the introduction of much larger quantities of the source material, these insects, that bo the bodies of which can be crushed and processed into a st much more stable, much less toxic red paint. So Anthony Van Dyck could paint the doge and not uh, get himself uh, very sick or, or nearly dead or, or actually dead. So uh, this particular type of red dye, and, and now I'm standing here doing my best to riff with, uh, without my notes, is uh, referred to as carnelian. Carnelian is the red uh, that uh, comes from this particular uh, type of insect. And then we'll jump ahead to uh, the last uh, type of red paint that I want us to be aware of, which is a cadmium red. And cadmium, again, is perhaps, uh, sounds like a metal that you might not want to have uh, around a lot. And there's issues right now internationally in the uh, proliferation of cadmium, particularly cadmium wastes. And for a while, uh, there were rumors going around and even actions taken officially to outlaw cadmium red paint 
because their cadmium was showing up in the biomass uh, around the world in quantities that made people worry that somehow we weren't managing the amount of cadmium that's being processed in particularly good ways. As it turns out, it wasn't the painter's fault. It was all the batteries that had been processed over the last 25, 30 years using lots more cadmium than the painters ever did. But cadmium red uh, was a synthetic uh, red, which these, a lot of the pigments that we now use were developed in the 18th, uh, late 18th and early 19th century with sort of the, the enlightenment and the growth in industrial chemistry as a process that can yield these synthetic pigments that are recreating in a laboratory setting through the heat and pressure of uh, a kiln or baking process, uh, more common raw materials that can be transformed through synthesis into stable uh, synthetic pigments. And so cadmium red is an example of this. Looking at Matisse's The Red Studio, uh, 1911, it's quite clear that Matisse uh, selected red with a clear purpose in mind. And so let's think a little bit about the art historical moment uh, that we've arrived in. It's very flat. He has stripped away most of the aspects of the composition that you think of as uh, illusionistic and extending the viewer into a space that is physical. And he's playing with us in a way by using this red pigment that's particularly effective at, at flattening and, and pressing the, 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 the contents of this studio onto the surface of the composition. Uh, although, if you look closely, and it might not be visible from the back of the room, you can see that there are lines, that there is sort of a perspectival aspect to the composition, but he's done it all wrong. I could point out two or three different ways that his, uh, his perspective has been reversed or inverted. And he didn't even draw these lines on the canvas. He used the red paint uh, over raw canvas and all of the white that you see, the chair and the, the stools in the back and the chest of drawers, the table, that's just raw canvas that, is, that he's left to peek through. And so he's, he's toying with the idea, traditional ways in which uh, Western art uh, represents interiors or still lifes, uh, furnishings, uh, to, uh, to explore in a formalistic way the potential of raw color uh, put into a composition like, like, uh, like these. And there were others. He did uh, the pink studio, he did yellow studio. It's a similar effect. Uh, but know that Matisse was among the very first artists to use in, uh, in any real quantity uh, cadmium red, cadmium sulfide, they can convert commercially available for general purposes around 1910, although it existed as a synthetic pigment that was available uh, within uh, laboratories and industrial contexts for some decades prior to that. And so he's among the first artists to use this pigment. So that is red. We've seen four different types of red, different times and places uh, that are employed. And now let's talk about orange. And I want to, I, I've tried to prepare the presentation in a way that makes some subtle art historical points at the same time that I'm talking about uh, pigment. So if you'll uh, indulge me, I'm going to switch from uh, Henry Matisse, Henri Matisse from 1911, very flat, removing that per perspectival uh, impression, pressing things up against the surface, using color to the, to the visual, uh, uh, its visual potential. And then we can look back at the Egyptians, right, who had done this uh, I don't know at this point, uh, 33, 3,400 years earlier, and you could go back another two or 3,000 years and see something similar. Uh, we'll use uh, the Egyptians to introduce orange, and uh, orange is uh, a, a pigment that you can obtain through uh, uh, mixtures of red and yellow pigment. In fact, until the 16th century, there wasn't a word in, uh, the, uh, in most European languages for orange as a separate pigment. It was called yellow-red or red-yellow. Uh, there were, uh, the, the color was of course recognized, it appeared in nature, but it wasn't thought of as something that had its own uh, status within the world of color. It was just an adulterated red or a kind of muddy uh, yellow. And the orange that the uh, <clears throat> Egyptians used was ground uh, pigment based in a mineral called realgar, which is arsenic sulfide. So there we go again, we have sulfur and arsenic. These very stable pigments allow us to see today, if you look at photographs here with the interior of the tomb of Tutankhamun, you can see uh, that the color has remained very fast uh, and is, we can imagine quite a bit, as much 
as vivid as it would have been at the time that it was created. Uh, so let me ask you, if you think about orange as a cultural phenomenon, what associations do you draw from orange? Maybe present day associations or global world cultural associations? Hot, anxiety, anger. Okay, so, so from an emotional standpoint, it's, it's, it's hot, there's anger, there's, there's intensity of emotion. Did you say fire? I, didn't, I, didn't, I should have. You should have said fire. Okay, so they have a fieriness, yes? Okay, makes, yes, please. It makes me think of food. Okay. Uh, warmth, the sun. Good, I like them too. Relaxed, sun, warmth. You know, vacation. <laughs> vacation, yeah, good. Fam you. Fam you, great, a good color. University of Florida. University of Florida also <laughs> uses a bit of the orange. All right, pardon? Autumn or fall. Autumn, Autumn or fall, Florida. good. Yeah. So there are a lot of associations that we have uh, with with orange, but we but orange is until until relatively recently has not been a big part of, of our history, uh, and and there's there's been a kind of reason for that. The pigment was very hard to, to create in stable quantities, and it was also a a color that that fell outside of the the, the palette that most Western Western artists used. However, in the in the East, it has a much longer tradition and one that's powerfully associated with Buddhism and the, uh, the, the belief that orange, because of its fiery associations, because of its natural associations, and, and light particularly, and heat and intensity is a cleansing uh, force. And that fire, the, the, a spiritual fire in a metaphorical sense, or a literal fire is that which consumes uh, and, and removes the, uh, the, 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 the physical matter and takes, takes that matter into something that's more transcendental is rooted in the application of a vegetable-based, naturally occurring dye materials like saffron and uh, turmeric, uh, which we think of as, thing, as, as kitchen uh, 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 ingredients, but which have for a very long time been the basis for using orange pigments to develop cloths and to integrate orange within to compositions that you find in much more frequency in uh, Eastern. Uh, context like representations of the Buddha. And we all perhaps uh, know of the saffron robes and the way that various monastic communities will wear these saffron orange garments as a way to signify purity, signify an aspiration, if, to the extent that you have aspirations when you're trying to reduce your ego, uh, to shed uh, those uh, preoccupations with materiality, with, uh, with uh, uh, egocentrism and the like. Um, so thinking about orange from a global historical standpoint, one stand counter it much more frequently is in representations of uh, Buddha. So someone said uh, fruit or, or uh, food and the associations with orange. As it happens, the word orange, I mentioned that it didn't really exist in uh, many European languages as a distinct color with a name until they started bringing oranges over from the New World and cultivating oranges in greater quantity. They had lemons, they had citrons, they had other fruits that were, that were citrus-based, but the introduction of vivid oranges actually gives us the word orange. The orange isn't called orange because we named it after the color. The color orange is called orange because we named it after the fruit. <laughs> Naranj and other uh, uh, Romantic languages are the basis for our use of the word orange. So here we have an example of Francisco de uh, Zurbarán, a beautiful still life painting, um, obviously using yellow and using orange to a powerful effect, but not a traditional representation of the subject matter of bolt bowls or baskets of fruit because it lacks something which you often see in Baroque era still life paintings, which is a signification of brevity of life. The, decaying, the consumption, right? the, the, uh, the way that fruit comes to symbolize uh, carnal appetites or a memento mori, a sense that yes, we feast today, we, we, we perish tomorrow. None of that is what is going on in this uh, particular composition. And the use of orange in the center, uh, pure kind of uh, unblemished fruit sitting in that basket alongside what were in fact not uh, not lemons, although the painting is called Still Life with Lemons, Oranges, and a Rose. Uh, that's the way it's always been referenced and translated. It, these are, those are citrons, uh, which if you know about the citron, it's essentially an, an unedible version of a lemon. 
um, whatever you think, however, however edible you think lemons are, citrons are, are even worse. <laughs> no, one, no one eats them. And the oranges, this was painted in Seville. Uh, and if you've been to Spain, or if you haven't, you might be aware that these oranges are intensely sour. Uh, you can't just take one down and peel them. You have to use them uh, with copious amounts of sweeteners or other things in order to make them uh, palatable at all. So these are, this is not a presentation of fruit that you'd want to reach out for, grab, and eat one of them. They're, they're almost inedible, yet they're perfect. And they're presented alongside a thornless rose. You can't see that from where you're sitting, but uh, it is, in fact, a rose that does not show any thorns on it. And a, a, a very delicate teacup with pure water in it. So any thoughts about what we might be seeing here? Uh, in this still life. There are, uh, there are also three aspects to this still life. The Trinity. Very nice. Yes, the Trinity, right? A, a, a metaphorical still life standing in the place of the representation of the Trinity within the Catholic or Christian tradition. And maybe uh, not only a portrait of the Trinity, but you could also see within this untouched fruit, pure, chaste water, thornless, or virginity. virginity. Yes, vir virginity, uh, the Immaculate Conception, uh, Mary represent. Now, these are, of course, all speculative readings of a still life that is so dis distinct and different from what other still lifes, uh, not Zuberon, but other, but other Baroque painters were painting at the time, that it does stand out as a, um, as a remarkable uh, and kind of unparalleled uh, work from its time. This is also, also has the distinction of being among the most expensive old master paintings ever sold. I think it was in the late 60s, around 1970, it was bought by Norton Simon in California for that collection. Uh, and in 1970, let's say, well, don't hold me to that, uh, it was it sold for over $2 million, uh, which today that's a colossal sum of money to buy a work of art with. Imagine how much more it was in 1970. The rumor was that Norton Simon bought it because otherwise it would have gone to Louvre. And so if you want to see it, you can um, go, to, go to California and check it out. So we have here a kind of pure representation that, of the fruit uh, and that vivid color orange representing something spiritual in a, a Western context as opposed to the Eastern context that we saw with the representation of Buddha. But fruit, juiciness, the richness and lusciousness of orange, the associations we draw from that were not lost on art. And so here's something that isn't virginal uh, or, uh, or representative of, of Mary. We have here Pomona, who is a, a, that's a Roman incarnation of, uh, of, of fecundity, and particularly as it comes to fruits and orchards. So uh, the, 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 the concept of the, the Pomona basically means sort of orchard fruit uh, from the root, the palm. Right, which I think if you have to go back to the Latin and maybe the Proto-European languages means that, that, that fruit to be taken. Uh, and you can see here a, uh, a, a, a apparition of this uh, represented in these flowing orange rows. Each of these paintings was using a, uh, a combination of minerals to make red and minerals to make yellow. They were blended into the orange. The singular orange pigment had not yet been synth synthesized. And so this was a blending of red and yellow. So we can look at this and remember that for much of the history of painting, you got your colors by blending other colors that were more readily available. You didn't create that pure essential color without the mixing. So we have here Pomona, who's reaching for a piece of fruit in her flowing orange robes. And let me ask, is anyone, can anyone think of another painting, world famous painting, maybe only recently became world famous in the last 25 or 30 years perhaps, of another figure in a vivid orange uh, sheer garment. One of the most celebrated works of Victorian painting by Frederick Lord Leighton. It's at the uh, Musée de Ponce in Puerto Rico. It is Flaming June. Have you seen this painting before? No? This is another interesting story. If you, we saw the still life that sold for $2.3 million in 1970. This painting, believe it or not, could, couldn't sell. No one would buy it out of the knickknack shop in London. It sat unsold, and eventually someone came along and purchased it for 150 pounds. And then that person couldn't find a buyer for it, and so they flipped it to a Puerto Rican 
uh, industrialist who was building a museum and wanted to have some really spectacular looking paintings to include in their museum, bought it for about 2,000 pounds. And now it's, uh, it makes uh, many hundreds of times over that each year in royalties for how often it's reproduced on posters that people put in their dormitory rooms and <laughs> people who are, you know, filmed. It's, it's a widely reproduced painting showing uh, what could be a kind of late 19th century iteration of that Pomona figure, that very, very sort of luscious, uh, juicy orange color. What we should also observe is that now we've arrived at a time when the synthetic process of pigment making allows for artists like uh, Frederick Lord Layton to use the powdered chrome orange, lead chromate, where you go again with those uh, our favorite uh, minerals and our favorite uh, uh, elements that go into making um, pigments. But Frederick Lord Layton's flame in June, you can see the sun is setting back there on the horizon, and that sheer orange garment um, is uh, just a, a, a unapologetic art for art's sake, late 19th century, Victorian meets Art Nouveau, explosion of color uh, and, and sensuality. And the last set of artists who we should uh, think of when we associate orange are the Impressionists, because the Impressionists were so interested in the sun and the effects of sun and light in the landscape, and I could have shown you any number of the Impressionists, but I'll uh, mention Claude Monet as a standout example of an artist who you'll find many, many paintings that feature orange uh, as the primary color. And that's because of the interest in the way that light plays off of the natural landscape, off of architecture, uh, and other spaces that you visited time and again to look at, at the way that color and art intersect. All right, so now um, we've reached a little more than the halfway point, I recognize that. But I will, uh, if you don't mind, give you a bit of an interlude. I have some music, quote unquote, for green. I turned this on, but now I find out. Does anyone know Ken Nordine's Colors album? Ken Nordine was a uh, voiceover artist who recognized his voice from the 60s. He recorded a whole suite of color word jazz uh, compositions for a paint company to use in their advertisements. And they became so popular that he decided to cut a whole album's worth of it. And I hope you like uh, Green. Oh, that wasn't it. <laughs> As an intellectual vibration, smack dab in the middle of spectrum, green can be a problem. <laughs> That's because there's so many different greens inside of green, and each one has a different IQ. There's the green that should never have happened, the stupid green. <laughs> The green that is green with envy. Then there's the so-so green. The who cares anyway green. But somewhere in green is a green here and there that has something to say. A truly intelligent green. A green with some integrity. That's the kind of green for you and me. There's a green to be seen with. Vivid, vibrant, living alive. We should spend the better part of our time, yours and mine, with a green like this. Maybe some of it would rip off. Inimitable Ken Nordine from Colors in 1966. So that's green. Of course, there's been lots of green in the history of art, but we're going to talk about blue. And we'll go back uh, to the Egyptians uh, to begin the quick history of blue. A blue faience, another way that, uh, that color emerges in, into art history is through glass making, basically. The firing of glazes and other materials that are ground, and the colors of which become uh, vi visible through the introduction of heat in kilns. And so fans basically is like a, a, a form of, of glazing and glass making. 
And if you think about this bright turquoisey color that's uh, associated with Egyptian uh, fans, you see the statuettes, uh, the, the uh, hippopotamus form, which is found in many tombs of uh, persons of status. Uh, and here you can see that this, this wall composition, it looks like something very abstract. Uh, it is in fact a set of tiles, uh, which were uh, cast and then placed on the wall of the funerary apartment of King Djoser. Uh, so this faience is a ceramic material in its essence. It has a silica body, glazes that are achieved through the introduction of copper compounds, and that heat creates a permanent bright blue color. Uh, now, in the history of Western art, uh, the most vivid blue, that kind of primary blue that we think of, uh, for the longest time came from uh, pigments that were ground from lapis lazuli. So this is among the rarest types of, of non-gemstone uh, minerals, and its primary uh, deposits, known deposits, are in Central Asia, particularly the region that is uh, modern Afghanistan. And so you see uh, early representations of uh, the Buddha in Afghanistan using this bright blue color on these wall frescoes here, rendered in pigments that were made from ground lapis lazuli. So because it was so expensive, very uh, dangerous uh, settings in which to work, these mountains, areas, uh, mining was hazardous. It was an expensive stone to obtain, and so the colors were extremely uh, expensive to get the raw materials for, and any processing of it uh, by its nature would introduce it impurity. So to get a pure, vivid, bright blue until the modern era, really, you had to use ex very expensive material. And in the West, that was reserved only for the most sacred uh, subject matter. So you will often see representations of Mary, representations of Jesus, representations of, um, of nobility where small uh, quantities or not such uh, immodest quantities like this uh, David painting of the Virgin uh, show the wealth of the commissioner primarily because it wasn't the artist who was fronting the money for this, it was their patron or sponsor who would be showing the church and showing the community their ability to command vast sums by obtaining lapis lazuli in quantities enough to create a full uh, painting that drapes uh, Mary in this bright blue. It would have stood out, perhaps, and almost certainly more so, so than gold, which was uh, available locally, and uh, you, could, you could coat uh, entire surfaces in gold by hammering it to a paper thinness, uh, and or even thinner than paper, and effectively make something look gold. Lapis lazuli, uh, while vivid and blue, you need more of it in layers to get that intense blue uh, impression. So we see a virgin represented here in lapis lazuli. We also see a Johannes Vermeer, who's rumored to have nearly bankrupted himself during his short life. Uh, he did not paint that many pictures. He used lapis lazuli in many of them, most famously Girl with the Pearl Earring. Uh, I, I decided to throw several uh, kind of celebrities in the mix today. We had Flaming June uh, from the Museo de Ponce, and now we have the Girl with the Pearl Earring illustrating the use of this bright blue lapis lazuli in quantities that really made this picture stand out among its peers as an expensive undertaking uh, that the artist pursued. Now, in the uh, early 18th century, so around 1710 or so, uh, German uh, engineers and uh, chemical engineers uh, perfect a process for developing what became known as Prussian blue. So it was using, again, more generally available raw material through a synthesizing process in a laboratory or in, uh, in a, uh, a kiln to create a synthetic simulation of what you previously could only obtain through the use of lapis lazuli, which in uh, Europe was referred to as ult ultramarine. Uh, so ultramarine, the color, is synthesized uh, and uh, you, create, you create a pigment that becomes widely available in the world. Uh, and in fact, it's exported from Europe back to the East where it becomes a color that's used in uh, Japanese ukiyo-e printmaking, most famously by Hokusai, whose wave, uh, perhaps the most uh, widely reproduced of the, uh, the um, <clears throat> ukiyo-e woodblock prints, show that uh, 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 in the East, the availability of blue had been limited 
by the rarity of the raw materials to make those pigments, and now through the magic of chemistry and, and modern industrial processes, you see the introduction of blue uh, in not just a work of art like a painting, but in a series of artworks like, a, like, like prints, right? Because if you think about the nature of prints and they're, they're being reproduced, dozens or hundreds of, uh, of individual pieces now uh, constitute a pr proliferation and explosion of the presence of blue in the history of art through reproductive printmaking and the availability of blue inks like Prussian blue. So this is another one of my clever juxtapositions. Uh, so we have a Hokusai's wave, and then we have Eve Klein's uh, anthropometry. So we know what we're seeing here, so we know about Eve Klein, the artist. A, he had a very short life, unfortunately, he died in his early 30s. But he had a, he had a, a big impact on the history of, kind of post-war modernism. He's uh, famous for a few uh, specific projects and undertaking, but very often he's referred to as the guy who invented the blue because he has international Klein blue was a particular formulation of ultramarine, synthetic ultramarine, that he worked together with a Parisian uh, paint company to develop so that he could use a blue that would be exclusively his. And the, and the subject of his work really became this blue paint and the application of this blue paint for its obvious associations over time with its rareness, its preciousness, kind of sacredness, and significance within the history of art as something that you just didn't have much of. Well, now he's got bucket loads of it. So much so of it so that he would slather it on the bodies of his models and then drag them. So if you think about the painting of the girl with the pearl earring or the painting of Mary, uh, we would use lapis lazuli to venerate the subject. And now we've sort of inverted this and now we have the painting, not of the woman, but the painting with the woman. Uh, to create the forms of that figure that have been dragged across the canvas, the evidence of this action, which was performed in a, uh, a, a, a gallery environment with very uh, natally dressed uh, attendants, uh, some of whom played chamber music live while this event uh, happened uh, before a paying audience. And you can see the evidence of this practice in these large canvases that were then uh, stretched and displayed his anthropometry series. And there were other works that show his International Klein Blue. They were numbered. This is International Klein Blue, IKB 45, from 1980, or 1960, pardon me, 1960, where you can see just the application of this vivid and intense ultramarine on textured surfaces to see the way that different textures, he used sponges, he used different panels and different plaster encrusted surfaces to show the way that that blue uh, creates a different visual uh, and powerful effect on the viewer. So this was the way that Klein played with blue, and international Klein blue is evidence that it was, blue was of such significance that an artist decided to make the color itself his practice. The last of our colors, and I'll go as quickly as I need to, is black. So once again, uh, we're sort of, we can think about the brush stroke, and we can think about the way that we're uh, we're finding within nature a desire to reproduce the beautiful world uh, in front of us. We're in the caves. We had soot that came from the process of combustion. Black pigments have really been around as long as fire has been around. And so if you think about the most essential black, right, and the use of inks and pigments from the earliest time, the least amount of processing involved in creating a, a, an ink or a pigment was, was black. So with no surprise, we see black in those cave paintings. We also see practices emerging that are, uh, that are purely the expression of black ink on some kind of, uh, of neutral surface. And the, the, the elegance of the brush stroke and the ability to take that ink and, and brush and reproduce something that is in the natural world is evidence of artistic mastery. So the practices that come out of the East uh, which I believe many people here at Lemoyne are familiar with because I know there's a very robust community of ink and brush artists uh, in Tallahassee and their work is extraordinary. It would be, rem would be uh, remiss not to acknowledge that perhaps the longest traditional use of black in artistic practice continuously over a thousand years of art making uh, is in this uh, East Eastern uh, landscape and representative paintings like this using uh, ink that's sourced from carbon 
and, uh, and some binder. Here's an example of something a little more uh, restrained, a little more austere, but perhaps one of the most famous examples of uh, the ink and wash uh, technique, these six persimmons, where you see that the mixture of the black with, uh, with the, the thinning of the, of the agent that it's suspended in allows you to go from a very light gray to a medium gray to a black. And looking a little more closely, we see that, that central uh, figure of the, of the persimmon has been reduced to something very abstract, this almost square-like shape, uh, complemented by uh, a, a, a figure, which is actually a word for the fruit that is suspended above uh, the fruit itself. So it's a combination of a letter standing in for uh, symbolic, uh, alphabetic, uh, or, or linguistic meaning, I should say, combined with the abstract shape of the fruit itself. And so a mixture of writing and painting using ink as the medium uh, on, on paper. So to show how this same premise that was being uh, explored in 1260 by Muki with six persimmons uh, looks about uh, <clears throat> 800 years later, uh, I want to talk about the black square, right? Uh, most people are aware of the black square. Do you know much about the black square? What do you think of the black square? There's always people who have strong opinions about the black square. This is uh, Kazimir Malevich's uh, most singular work, singular because it is simply the black square, but it, it has a, a lot of significance within the history of modernism. And the reason that the black square was created at all uh, comes from a time of revolution in Russia and a desire to strip away all representational content. And so what you see here is a kind of doubling down representation. You see the figure of the persimmon and the character representing the persimmon combined, and here you just have the square. It was actually, uh, before it was a black square, it was a composition. You can see it kind of peeking through. There were geometries and colored forms that eventually Malevich decided weren't necessary to make the point that he wanted to make, which was to be so reductive that all, all that is left is that color black in a simple square shape. The first iteration of this came a couple of years before 1915 when he was asked to create a suite of artworks for a play called Victory Over the Sun. On this, these are revolutionary times. The Russian Revolution has not happened yet, but the uh, World War is underway. There's a lot of absurdity and there's a desire to sort of tear down convention and replace it with something that might make a little more sense than the insanity that's being played out uh, on the world stage. So the stage for Kuchinik's uh, Victory of the Sun included a drapery that came down. The entire uh, concept for the play is that people were working on capturing the sun, disabling the sun, and stopping time. So very uh, absurd uh, uh, premise, but one that, uh, that at the time within avant-garde theater uh, wasn't all that uncommon. And Malevich decides to create a set of a set that's created of pure geometry in a few very limited colors. The black square uh, began as a stage curtain, but then it becomes a revolutionary symbol. It becomes something that has taken the, the likeness away. Uh, icons within Russian art and culture are so central to what it meant to be Russian that to take an icon away and replace it with something that is meaningless was like the tabula rasa from which you could build a new society. And the black square was the beginning. Of course, there were other shapes that followed, and he created an entire kind of uh, linguistic set of these geometries that were paired with black, that colorless, meaningless, empty void, if you will. And so we'll end with a void. Uh, because black has been uh, used to represent nothingness, represent absence, represent darkness, represent hell uh, for, for, for all time. Uh, but recently, very recently, just in the past few years, uh, we've moved on from the type of black that Malevich was able to obtain through the use of conventional carbon-based pigments into something much more extraordinary. Has anyone heard about Vanta black? Yes? Vanta black, right? So Vanta black is a laboratory-based material that is made through uh, the very controlled distribution of carbon nanotubes 
in, an, in a, 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 a pattern that when it's applied to the surface of anything, basically, makes it 99.97% non-reflective. Ordinarily, if you apply black to the surface of something, you can see that there's a surface there. But what you have here is actually a person holding a sphere, and yet the sphere disappears entirely because it's been coated in this material called Vanta Black. Vanta Black, Vantus, standing for vertically aligned carbon nanotube arrays. Now, is this art history or is this uh, the history of science? Well, it's, it's an intersection of both, but as it happens, uh, artists are usually uh, thinking about how they can get, gain some um, advantage when something new in the world of pigments comes along. And just like Eve Klein created International Klein Blue uh, in the, in the mid-1950s, uh, the artist Anish Kapoor, who's famous, maybe most famous in the United States for the, the big bean-shaped sculpture in, uh, in Chicago, big uses uses polished uh, stainless steel in a lot of large public monumental pieces. Anish Kapoor contracted with the inventors of Vanta Black to be the exclusive, licensed, authorized user of this material for artistic purposes, and he gained an exclusive permission so that no other artist could use Vanta Black. Hmm. That seems a little selfish, right? <laughs> uh, but you can see what it does. This, I, I don't need to explain it, it's, it's self-evident. That, that bust vanishes entirely when it's coated in Vandalite, even for when you're photographing. You can't, that light won't bounce off of, it, off of it. There was a flash used to take this picture and it's just, it's, it's a void. Well, uh, Anish Kapoor, some years prior, had created a series of artworks called Void, but they weren't nearly voidy enough when he made them originally. <laughs> And so he decided that he was going to recreate Void using Vanta Black. And uh, this, again, is a three dimensional uh, relief sculpture that's installed on a gallery wall there that, that disappears entirely. And standing in front of it is no different. Don't think that this is a, the, a, the, uh, an artifact of the, of the photographic process. It, it, it vanishes. And even on the screen, you can see that it just disappears. And that hole that was on the ground. Uh, is similarly uh, sort of empty of all visible matter. You, you just simply you can't see it. It's, it's pure black. Well, uh, the, the world of art thought this was um, unfair that uh, Anish Kapoor was the only person who could use Vanta Black, particularly since all he wanted to do, and here I'm being a bit of a critic, but so be it, all he wanted to do was create a big hole with it, right? Like that doesn't seem like the best, most interesting thing that you could do. Well, there's another uh, English artist. His name is Stuart uh, Simple. And Stuart Simple decided he was gonna work with his own team to create blacker things, maybe not quite as black as Vanta Black, but he was gonna make it broadly available to the public by in in integrating some of what these engineers had been able to do into material that wasn't 99.97% non-reflective, but let's say 98.9% non-reflective, or 99.2%, depending on the mixtures that he was able to obtain. And he's gonna sell it for $16.99 a bottle. So you can buy, Blink was the first of these, black ink, and he will sell it to anyone except Anish Kapoor. <laughs> And when you buy it, you have to actually sign a form saying that you're not a proxy for Anish Kapoor and you're not going to sell it to that artist. And he did an entire series of these colors that he, he you know, sells at very uh, reasonable prices. Uh, and he got into, as you can imagine, um, quite, a, quite a, a time with Anish Kapoor saying, look, you know, I've got to make, I gotta make millions. So you, know, you don't make millions unless you, you, you get exclusive licenses. And Simple says, democracy. Um, I'm going to share what I've got, and so I welcome you, if you're interested, to get your own uh, bottle of Blink, or the world's blackest black, it's now in its third iteration, Black 3.0, and it's a very black black, my friends. Uh, so if you think that you're working with a black pigment now, try Stuart Simple's uh, Blackest Black, and you'll, uh, you'll discover new ways of introducing non-color to your artistic compositions. And while this is way too small for people to read, it's pretty funny because this is the announcement of Black 2.0 and he really savages uh, Anish Kapoor in the process of rolling this color out. So I will end here by asking you what your favorite color is and thanking you for listening to me ramble about colors 
and give you just a tiny surface scratching introduction to the history of pigment and ways that art has used color to different effects at different times and different places. So I appreciate that. Thank you.